you'd open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, and we'll read, uh, I'll read the first six verses. It's in your pew Bible there in front of you, page 1009, 1009. And just follow along as I begin reading at verse 1 of chapter 13. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, And let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. I had planned to preach on this subject last Sunday, but this this past, uh, because of all that had been going on with uh, the Wenzel family, that's why I spoke about health care and actually who we can trust when it comes to our bodies and our lives, ultimately. But this topic, I believe, is something that needs to be addressed and needs to be talked about. And um, the topic is the the idea of same-sex marriage, and I put that in quotations. It will make sense in a moment why I do that from the outset. But I pray that as I'm sharing, I would pray I, I would pray that as I'm talking with you this morning, as I'm sharing what I believe the Word of God has to say about this subject, that it would not be a time of condemnation, it would not be a time of judgment, that we would allow God's Word to do its work in our lives, in each and every one of our lives, and that uh, I thank God for men that um, and women, but men in particular, that as I've listened to their sp- teaching on this subject, whether it be Wayne Grudem or John Piper, um, John MacArthur and others that have been used of God to bless my heart, that as I, um, as I share with you, understand that I do it, I hope, as, as the heart, from the heart of a pastor that desires to minister to all people and to be faithful to the text of the scripture. So I want to pray and ask the Lord to do his work. And uh, you pray with me because we need to address these things uh, biblically and in a way that honors God. So let's talk to him right now. Father, thank you for how you're honest with us. You tell us the truth and you, um, you don't mix words uh, that you, for whatever reason, have entered our lives and and desire to use us to reconcile people to yourself. I think of what we were learning in Sunday school class and how it's it's kind of ludicrous. It's kind of absurd that those that in a book that is packed with stories, we only got it right in the first two chapters. And then from then on, we've messed up big time. And you've come and saved the day. And then you didn't just leave it that way, but you said, and by the way, I want to use you. I want to use you messed up individuals for my glory. So thank you, God, for your grace that is being poured out. And we ask you, God, that in a culture that you place us, this is the time that you've called us to. We don't want to curse the darkness. We'd actually ask ask that as we light the candle of God's word, that the truth would just proclaim and that it would be evident in our lives and we'd be living as forgiven people, as people that have found bread. We're beggars and we've found where bread is and we just want to share it with other people. So thank you that at the cross, the ground is level. 
and that we all need Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. I was thinking of how different things creep in. I had opportunity. I don't know if you know this, but what our college age young people are dealing with on a regular basis in the colleges that they go to. Um, but the, the pressure, uh, not necessarily maybe a Christian college, but in other colleges, but I would think it's, it's across the board just because of the times we're living in, had opportunity to talk to a friend whose daughter right now is attending um, a university in Illinois. And that she is in classes where, when it comes to the, the issue of homosexuality, she has to be understanding, even as she's writing papers, to be very, very careful how she words things, how she addresses different issues concerning this, because it could come across as hate speech. It could come across as being um, vindictive and mean, and that has happened over the years. And, but the pendulum has swung so much so that things that when I was younger and the generations before me, they would be surprised at how far it has come. And so when we think of our young people, I want you to pray for them as opposed to complaining about them and to say, I want God's glory in their life and I want you, God, to protect them, guard their hearts, but give them a love for this group of people that have been placed, whatever their issues are, around them. This generation, you young people, I'm impressed with so many different things that I could list on how you handle different things. I, I'm just blessed by you. And so I want you to know that. Uh, but I think that we get to the place that we're at not by accident. And I was just thinking about how thoughts concerning stuff just in the area of TV. We could talk about movies and music and things along the line, but just for TV for a moment, just to think about that. And I was thinking of when I was a kid growing up and the whole idea of homosexuality or someone being gay, I was like, uh, I remember the first time that I saw something where that was addressed. And, that, and, and what it was, was this show, and so what I'm going to talk about right now is uh, comedy shows. And th so there was this show called Soap that was on TV, on ABC, from 1977 into 1981. And it was one of the first shows that had a character, Billy Crystal, who we know, the comedian Billy Crystal, who was a gay man, openly gay man, on that show. I remember seeing that. And it was shocking. And there was, there was discussions, there were boycotts going on, there was fear that if, if, this, if this continues, this could get interesting. But it just kept, it was accepted, and they pushed the boundaries on this, and, and people laughed. And by the way, I want you to understand something about comedy, and even, or even just humor. God even tells us concerning laughing and jesting and stuff, and, and I don't know if you know this, but I love comedy. I don't know if you've ever picked that up, all right? I love a good joke. I love, I love humor. But I see, in, even in my own life, how if I am not careful, certain things break down as I laugh. Does that make sense? That I would, certain things would become acceptable. That if something was thrown at me in a non-humorous way, I might, whoa, no, no, I can't go there. But since it's kind of snuck in that way, I can, oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So soap. In the 90s, I don't know if you knew this, but there was actually a show called Ellen. Ellen had a show, and at a certain point, Ellen DeGeneres had a TV show. She was a comedian that had a TV show. In fact, it, it was uh, successful points, so much so she used a situational humor, and she was like Seinfeld. They called her the female Seinfeld. And so Ellen had her show, and at a certain point, a, sh a certain episode, she comes out. And coming out means she declares openly that I am gay. And so much so that that came out, and then a Time Magazine article came out. And I you remember this article when it came out. I remember it. And it had such ramifications because at a certain point, in fact, she came out personally on 
Oprah Winfrey show. And then in that show, that sitcom entitled Ellen, she came out and told that this is the, this is the reality in my life. And so much backlash came from that that ultimately that show didn't, I don't remember it lasting much longer than that. But what I find interesting is she's actually come back and she's got her own talk show. And if you've ever watched her own talk show, she is one of the best talk show hosts I've ever seen in my life. And some of you might be, I cannot believe that you're advocating for somebody that is gay. Do you realize that the gifts that she's been given as a communicator were given to her by God? Amen. She is a picture of the image of God, even in her sinfulness, to be used to communicate. Just so you know, I, I place this in my creation because all of us have been given what we've been given as a, a gift of God. Even those that do not claim him as Jesus Christ as Lord. Isn't that intriguing? That God in his grace, and the Latin term for it is the imago dei, he places his image. And so when I've seen her on this show, I said, she is an incredible communicator. A gift given to her by God. And a, an amazingly successful show. Recently, a show has come out called Modern Family, one of the best, well-written shows, comedies, uh, hilarious show. On the show, there is a same-sex couple that have an adopted daughter that if you watch them, you actually, your heart, they are endearing to you. You actually, as you spend time with them, you actually get, because this is what happens with stories, TV shows, whatever. I was thinking as you were playing that song, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? All I could think about, well, that song, and this is going to sound really not spiritual. I mean, I love the song, but I was thinking of the Andy Griffith show, and I was waiting for somebody to play the spoons or the jug, you know, while that was going on. Because I remember, and it just, it did my heart well. And then I'm singing these words, and I'm singing them going, there is so much truth in this right now. But I was endeared to Andy Griffith back in the day and Aunt B and all of them. I just was endeared to them. On this show, if you were to watch it, that's between you and the Lord and whoever, you, you become endeared toward different people. So much so that people that are living lives that you would be like, I cannot believe it. You're endeared. You don't agree with it, but you're endeared toward them. Recently, another show came out called The New Normal. That's the title of today's message. I have the new normal question mark. Because what I think has crept in, and it's even mentioned, it's been mentioned, I've heard it on the debate. The new normal, that they asked the president concerning, is the new normal these numbers when it comes to unemployment? That we accept this as acceptable? And so in the new normal, there is another couple, same-sex couple. And what I'm saying is, we start with soap, and by the way, it didn't start there. Did you know all this stuff started like way back in the garden? Okay, none of these things are new. But you, you, have you ever read Genesis throughout? It's like really warped, dysfunctional people that God in his grace goes, I'm going to reach in and do something in your life. So it's nothing new. Sin didn't start with Elvis. <laughs> and so I say all that, that it's get. and by the way, there's dramas that have um, gay characters. Most of the time those are on cable, but other times it just creeps in. And what it does is it just keeps, keep, I'll keep doing this, I'll keep doing this, I'll keep doing this. And at some point, you got to accept us. We're going to be in your face. You're going to, uh, and, and musically, I could list Elton John and others, and, and then I could list movies with Brokeback Mountain, and you could go on and on, and it's just, this is acceptable in this community, and we're going to make it not just acceptable here, but we're going to make it acceptable everywhere, and we are here. And I, and I open up the Word of God, and I say to myself, and, and to you this morning, how do we address this, and how do we address it in a way that honors God? Because we do have to make judgments sometimes. 
but some of the things that I've seen on TV in response to um, this community or the, the guys that this pastor that's out uh, in the Midwest, a little west of here, that him and his church, they go picketing at different military funerals and they've got these signs and they say, and I want to constantly go, hey, by the way, I'm not with him. I want to apologize for what this guy's doing. But I have to address it. And so let's jump in here. There's notes, and if you want to write in, and we'll just we'll move through this as quick as we can. But I hope um, doing it justice. Let's let's first of all start with what is the definition of marriage? Because we have to we have to address what the definition of marriage is. So if you want to fill some blanks in there, please do that, and and we'll look at the scriptures together. It says uh, the, this is a great definition, not original with me. Marriage is the sexual and covenantal union of a man and a woman in lifelong allegiance to each other alone as husband and wife with a view toward Christ and his church. Okay, you got all that? Pretty long in there, but I wanted to, to get this point. Well, let's look at four passages of scripture and you can look at them up here. Write them down uh, so later you can look at it. But first of all, Genesis 1, 27 and 28. And I want you to understand that this isn't a Jewish thing in the area of the Jewish law. You can't put, this isn't Judaism. This isn't even Christianity. This is pre all of that. This is at the, the, the time of creation because, and we believe the Bible. So we're going with the Bible. Okay. Concerning this one. The time of creation, God set up a standard here. So look at this, Genesis 1, 27, 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we see here that God does this, and then he links his design for manhood and womanhood. Genesis 2, 23 and 24. Then the man said, so God, you know, remember, I don't know if you remember this, but, but Adam, he, he named all the animals. I love that story. God brings them all back, and, he, and some, he starts putting, he sees these animals, and he's going, oh, wait, he's got this, and I got nobody. And so God, go to sleep, takes a rib fashions this woman. He wakes up and he's got this beautiful woman coming his way. Like, this is really cool. All right. And what's, real, what's cool, it's the first song. It's a poem here. Then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So God creates man, human, male and female, and that there might be a one flesh sexual union and covenantal cleaving with a view to multiplying the human race, displaying God's covenant with his people and eventually God's covenant with his church. Jesus picked up this link and he brings these two verses together or these two passages of scriptures together. Look at this, Matthew 19, 4 through 6. He answered, have you not read, I love how he would address these people, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And, and I want to just sidestep something for a moment, or actually address something. I have heard, because I have as many talks as are needed about this issue with Christians and non-Christians alike concerning this, that the whole homosexual issue, Jesus never addressed it. They'll say that. You, all your verses, you do that Leviticus thing, you do the Sodom and Gomorrah thing, but you, Jesus never addressed it. I, I put before you, Jesus did address it. He just didn't, he didn't condemn homosexuality. What he lifted up was heterosexual relationship in marriage. This is the ideal. This is what God's called us to. And by the way, Paul addresses it, and we'll look at it later. So it isn't just an Old Testament, vindictive, angry, judgmental thing. 
It is something that he says in love, this is the ideal. This is what I've called you to. And so he brings those verses together. But there, here's something else. He goes even farther with it, and Paul does this, and he says, and by the way, I didn't just do this for this nice thing that men and women would have later. I did it because I created this situation because I wanted to show you something. And in Ephesians, he shows us what the mystery is. Look at this. Ephesians 5, 24 through 32. This is huge. This is so huge. Now, as the church submits to Christ... So also wives should should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of the body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, look at he's quoting, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So you might be going, what's the big deal? Just let him do this. Let him redefine marriage. He defines marriage as one man, one woman, because he knows that there's a mystery that needs to be revealed. So a mystery is an unveiling. That's where we get the word revelation. He reveals something. He goes, you know why I made it this way? That the man would be this way and a woman would be this way and they would be united and become one flesh. I'm giving you a picture of Christ and the church. And in a homosexual relationship, it doesn't give us that picture. It's Christ and Christ or church and church and it doesn't work that way. And so there's more at stake here than just, oh, just don't get so worked up about this. You're, you're, you're making more of it. No, I'm not. So God uses marriage to teach the world what the relationship between Christ and the church is supposed to be. How I treat my wife communicates to this world how Christ treats the church. The roles of husband and wife are not interchangeable. The husband displays the sacrificial love of Christ's headship, and the wife displays the submissive role of Christ's body. The mystery of marriage is that God had this double of husband and wife display in mind when he created man as male and female. Marriage is a covenantal union between a man and a woman. This is huge. Point two. Why I did the quote, same-sex marriage. There is no such thing as same-sex marriage. The reality is not only that same-sex marriage should not exist, it does not and it cannot. Those that believe that God has spoken truthfully, if we believe this is the word of God, we can't concede that the lifelong partnership and sexual relationship between two men or two women is marriage. It is not. God has created a defined marriage, created and defined marriage, and we have to go by God's rules. And by the way, I love people that dearly that differ with me on this issue. I love them. But I don't, I don't stop sharing what I share just because I don't want to hurt people's feelings. It's hard. These are hard conversations. And by the way, it isn't going to get easier. I'm telling you right now. Point three. Same-sex desire and same-sex orientation are a result of the brokenness of sin. In Genesis 3, we read about that horrible moment when the first man and woman rebelled against God. The effects on them and the world are described in chapters 3 and 4 and then illustrated in the history of the Old Testament and the history of the world. What happened in that garden affected every one of us. In fact, Paul talks about it. Look at Romans 8, 20 and 21. 
For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So when that decision was made, when that sin happened, this is what happened. Our bodies deal with that situation. Romans 8.23. And not only the creation, because some of us may go, well, this doesn't affect me. It doesn't, this, doesn't, this doesn't have ramifications for me. I'm a new creature. Amen. We're in Romans 8. I want you to know. By the way, we got saved in Romans 4. I found out I was a sinner in Romans 3 and Romans 1 and 2. Okay? By the time I get to Romans 8, I'm thinking, this, I'm on a roll here. Okay? Romans 7 is brutal. All right? So I get Romans 8, and not only the creation, but we ourselves. So he's talking to believers who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Look at look what we do. We groan inwardly as we wait e- for that circle to be unbroken. As we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. I, that's why we sing about heaven. That's where we're like, it's so, I don't know if you've ever felt this way with certain sin. I can't wait to be in heaven so I don't do this stupid thing anymore. I don't know if, you've ever, if you've never felt that way, guess what? You're in fantasy land. I don't, do you sin? Or do you have a, pro, a real, real realization of how sinful we are? And in Christ, to the freedom that he brings, and, and these moments where you're like, oh, this is so cool what you've done. I'm not being a good boy just because I'm a good boy. You're doing that work. You're giving me a love for what is good and a hatred for what is evil. But I groan because I'm broken. The truth is that same-sex desire and same-sex orientation are part of the groaning, waiting for the redemption of our bodies. Because there may be somebody, even in this room right now, that struggles with that issue. And what they do is they feel judgment. Oh, this is, it's an abomination. And that's what we raise when we get our, that vein just popping. And, 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 you, so, so, and the thing is, but that's not your thing, so you can get all worked up about it. But guess what? They're, they're in a broad category. Those people that are groaning, they, that's, they've got same-sex desire or same-sex orientation, and they struggle with that. But guess what? If we made a list of all the stuff, this is where it's all of us here. I hope you all come in instead of going, yeah, where, where are those people that need to hear this? Guess what? It's all of us need to hear this. Greddy. If we made a list of all the stuff that we are all broken in, it would be unending. It would be brutal if we start listing all of our sins. And all of us are broken and disordered in different ways. All of us are bent to desire things in different degrees that we should not want. And so this, this, is, this is where, come with me. This should motivate us not to hurt people or ourselves unnecessarily. All of our disorders, all our brokenness, it's rooted in sin. Original sin and our sinful nature. Same-sex desires are sinful in the sense that they are disordered by sin and exist contrary to God's revealed will. But to be caused by sin and rooted in sin does not make a sinful desire equal to sinning. Amen? Sinning is what happens when rebellion against God expresses itself through our disorders. And some people are just sitting there and they're they're struggling with this issue. And you're like, I can't believe they do. Well, guess what? If I spent enough time with you, I could talk to you about your disorder and where you are broken. That's why I think a lot of people don't spend too much time with certain people. I just want to make people look like everything okay, but come on a mission trip with me. Come to snow camp, and guess what? You'll find out my disorders, my quirks, my stuff that you're like, man, I need to pray for him. Amen, pray for me. I'll receive it. Point four. Therefore, same-sex intercourse, not same-sex desire, is the focus of Paul's condemnation. 
clearest statement, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Or do you not know, well, these are important verses, listen to this, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at that list. It's interesting, this word, the words men who practice homosexuality, translation of two Greek words which refer to the passive and active partners in homosexual intercourse. Robert Gagnon says this, The focus is not on same-sex desire, but on same-sex practice. And it is also included in other forms of sinning, idolatry, adultery, stealing, greed, drunkenness, etc. I understand what I'm about to say, and I know that some of you are, Now, wait a second. It, it is important what a person thinks. You remember Jesus, he said that thing in Matthew 5. He said, you've never committed adultery? Great, but... I say to you, he who looks at a woman has committed adultery in his heart already. But when somebody has a brokenness towards something or a desire that they've been, that that they have because of the brokenness of sin and they're groaning inwardly, that reality, that's one thing. It's another thing that they dwell on it. Does that make sense? I'm differentiating between the two. Because some of you have a bent toward gossip. Some of you have a bent toward alcohol. Some of you, and I could start listening, lust, heterosexual lust. I I keep going on. We all, and then we put stuff in the backpack by experiences and and things along that line. And we, and we're Christians, but we, 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 we struggle in these areas and and it's just, it's, there's a frustration and I I don't want to be like this. If you could imagine a young person or an older person that is in church and they're hearing about these different things and they're just condemning themselves because that's their brokenness. That's their issue. And it's eating them alive. Like your issue, if you'd own up about your issue. It's killing them. The, them having that thing, they aren't necessarily sinning. It's when they act on it like when we act on our stuff, whatever it may be. And I want to go back to that list again, if you would, Janet. Look at the list. Any of you are idolaters? Any of you immoral? Any of you ever you steal something ever? Greedy? You swindle? I don't swindle, I don't even know what it means. Okay. You move in such a way to get your way. Let's keep going. Please stay with me. Verse uh, point number five. Thus, it would contradict love and contradict the gospel to approve homosexual practice, whether by silence or endorsing same-sex marriage. We can't back down. The world is going to say the opposite of what is true. They will say warning of coming judgment is hateful. It is not hateful. Hate does not want people to be saved. Hate does not want people to join the family. Hate wants to destroy, and sin is what actually destroys If the practice of homosexuality and the practice of greed and the practice of idolatry and the practice of drunkenness leads to this exclusion from the kingdom of God, as God's word says, then it love, then love warns. And I would tell people, this is wrong, but Christ. The same thing I would say if somebody was caught in idolatry or or, or pornography or whatever those things that God convicts us of. And I tell you, this, this kind of time as we look in this word together should make us the most humble of people instead of the most judgmental. Point six. The good news of Jesus Christ is that God saves heterosexual sinners and homosexual sinners. 
who trust Jesus by counting them righteous because of Christ and by helping them through his spirit to live lives pleasing to him in their brokenness. After warning, Paul writes 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. He says this. I, I love this verse. And such were some of you, after the warning, and such were some of you, the list that we just got done looking at. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. He, he literally could go into the church of Corinth and say, there were people in there that had... They, they had a bent, a desire towards same-sex relationships. And he goes, and such were some of you. And he could have pointed them out because he knew. Such, you, you used to be a drunkard. You used to be this. But God did this. And God gets the glory. This is the heart of Christianity. Such were some of you. And the church takes in people that have been saved from sin and they join the family. And how do they join the family? They're justified. They put their trust in Christ. They turn from their practice. They renounce sinful pursuit of their desire. And God continues to do his work in them. He goes then, uh, the righteousness of Christ. He, they grow in the righteousness. They are become acceptable in his sight. They are adopted in his family. And they're washed. They're clean. They're sanctified. And the heart of the message is that Jesus Christ came to die and rise again for our salvation, for the salvation of any sinner, heterosexual or homosexual. That person can be saved from a destructive path. Point seven. Deciding what actions will be made legal or illegal through civil law is a moral activity aiming at the public good and informed by the worldview of each participant. I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase, you cannot legislate morality. Have you ever heard that phrase? That's a lie. Hear me, because you, you, you guys, if you haven't heard it in school yet, you're going to hear it. You cannot legislate morality. I'm coming down for effect. <laughs> morality is legislated all the time. There's laws against stealing. Why? I like stealing. Who are you to tell me that stealing is wrong? I want... Danny's car. Do I want your car, Danny? Is it really worth it? Yeah, I want Danny's car. <laughs> and so when Danny's not looking, I'll take his keys and I'll steal his car. I'm telling you my plan. All right. But, but that's against the law. That's a stupid law. I like stealing. And we could go law after law after law. The government set up for the public good... <laughs> And so laws are made to protect the public. But who are you to tell me that I shouldn't do that? What are, and so we have to point at something. There's some sort of moral base that says this is right and this is wrong. And we've decided as a community that this is the way it is. We don't like stealing. So we made a law. Now notice we didn't make a law against coveting. Isn't that interesting? Because we don't know. I mean, there's times where it's like, you hear people, man, I'd like to have that car. Arrest him! <laughs> there's no laws again. You can't do that. They can think it all they want, but at some point they act on it, and okay, something needs to be done concerning this. I really believe when it comes to the issue that we've been addressing the most today, and that being the, the issue of homosexuality and redefining marriage, that's the biggest issue for me with this. We grow tired of fighting this. And as time goes by, you'll meet more and more people that will come out and people that you love dearly. 
and you will grow tired of it. And I have discussions with Christian friends of mine that I think have grown tired of it. And so what they've done is they have rationalized that section of Scripture. They've bought the lie. And so they believe they are more loving than me because they're going, you know, we are so much farther along than you in this area. We get it. So we're going to allow this. I'm telling you, it smacks of the church in Corinth. That when something was going on in an immoral way in that church, they were, so, they were like, can't you see how loving we are? And God in his grace says, i got to call this sin. And I need to address it like any other sin. So my admonition to us as a church today, because some of you might be going, so let me tell, tell me how to vote. Just tell me how to vote. This, that's your call. But righteousness exalts a nation. And so our nation, as it heads a certain way and as it, as it heads, you know, different, different parties have different planks and, and some will say, well, we include God and some say we vote out God. Guess what? Just keep God out of that. Let's, let's, as a church, be what we need to be. Government is something that God has placed in, but there's like, I'm starting waving the flag. Let's do this. Let's vote biblically. And have and be, either party. But when it comes to this issue, because this is going to get more and more, this is going to have ramifications for me. I just want you to know that. Because as it heads this direction... There will be people that will come into this building and say, I want to get married here. Will you let me? And I will have to at some point say, no. And I've done this before, by the way. Not necessarily with this issue, but other issues. I said, no. But as time goes by, I don't know when it will be, but I think the day will come that I might be going to jail. Bear with me. I'm going to sound so noble. I pray he gives me the grace at that time. But i got to go with God. So as I'm firm in this area, as I'm direct in this area, also, I want to also say to you, you might get this one down, yeah, and you, we got to get this word out. And guess what? Let's just ease up, Rambo, okay? <laughs> because I really believe we get worked up about certain sins, and God with this whole thing is for us to elevate marriage. Husbands, you know, they, they, you might be like this, I, uh, 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 are you loving your wife? I'm so, oh, I'm so glad you got this, this thing down. But are you loving your wife? Wives? Are you loving your husband? Are you, are you, the oh, Bible says submitting. It's mutual submission, by the way, in the scriptures. I'm telling you, I want to get back to the word. So it's just a perfect balance so that if somebody, because as we have an environment in this church family of love, true godly love, I think people that would, would be um, struggling with different issues would start being able to talk about it as opposed to, boy, I see how they're reacting to that issue. I could never tell any of all about what I'm dealing with. Let's, let's make this our prayer. That this would be a place that, that when it would be all honest between us and the Lord, we can look at that verse and says, And such were some of you, but you were justified. And you were sanctified. You were washed so that God would get the glory. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.